welcome to the Monday evening uh, Vascular Society Aspire uh, teaching. Today we are delighted to have Seamus Harrison, who is from Anbrooks and Cambridge, to give us his take on the management of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, building a team approach. And to help him out, we have Meryl Davis uh, from the Royal Free, who I'm sure you all know, and Wakar Youssef from Brighton, who you I am sure I also all know. Um, I think the talk is going to last, so, well, anything between an, uh, 45 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes, depending on how much we talk through it. But there's some natural breaks in the talk where uh, Seamus is going to pause and challenge the panellists and the chairman to speak. Uh, we'd also encourage anyone who is listening to put their questions to Seamus as we go through so that we can have a, a discussion uh, through the question and answers button that should be at the bottom of your screens. If you do it through the questions and answers button, I will see it and I will uh, ask your question as we go through. Uh, the only other thing to say is uh, it's my wedding anniversary and thank you very much for joining me and celebrating it with me. And uh, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful that you have. So, um, if we are ready, then Seamus, can I hand over to you to start the talk? I think yep. we've got 75 people uh, joining us. I can't see it going up particularly quickly. So thank you very much, Tamer. Uh, the, um, I can't see it going up very quickly. So let's start and uh, anyone else joining can catch up later on. Thank you very much, Seamus, for, for uh, parting your knowledge with us this evening. <laughs> Uh, happy anniversary. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, when I, I was asked to give this talk because I'm, I'm counsel on BSET and a, a list of talks were sent round and a number of the talks I felt like I knew quite a lot about, but unfortunately they were all taken. Um, and so this is, this is what we've ended up with. Um, I also haven't managed to uh, uh, log into one of the webinars before so this is slightly unusual and odd um, but hopefully we'll have some good discussion as we go through all right so uh, this is not a technical talk about how you fix aneurysms how you uh, select aneurysms uh, different techniques of repair this is really assuming that everybody has had training in in treating ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms and it's how when you start your consultant job, you may think about uh, leading the team that will ultimately deliver these operations. Um, this is relatively an evidence-free zone, though there are, there are some emerging data, uh, and that makes things both difficult uh, and easy. So there's very much a personal uh, slant on what I'm going to tell you, but hopefully it will at least uh, stimulate some thought. As we've mentioned, there are a couple of sort of natural breaks when I will hand over to the panel um, and they may, go, may be good points to pick up on any questions that you may have. The first thing I would say is that before considering the team, um, I, I think you have to be selfish uh, and you have to consider yourself and consider uh, the impact that ruptured aneurysms may have on you in your consultant career. Ruptured aneurysms somehow have a sort of mystical place in our list of operations. And it seems to be how we judge ourselves and how we, we, we judge our colleagues. And I think for those of you who have read The House of God, there are a couple of quotes which I think are quite relevant. The first is, um, at a cardiac arrest, the first thing you should do is check your own pulse. And the second one is, remember, it's the patient that has the disease. So that is to say that... Uh, these are stressful, these are time dependent, but just take a moment and, and be calm before you embark upon uh, leading the team. I think there's no doubt that I find ruptured aneurysm stressful and I'm sure most of my colleagues do. I think it's important for you to recognize, um, I think you probably do as trainees, but particularly as a consultant, um, but bad outcomes do have an impact upon uh, your your well-being really, your mental health, and, and they can even uh, impact upon how you practice vascular surgery. So reflect on that before they happen to you. 
Uh, and to continue the slightly negative theme, uh, it's been my experience that, that failures in treating ruptured aneurysms have certainly lived longer in the, men, uh, lived longer in the memory than the heroic successes that I've had. And, and that's something to bear in mind. The other thing that I always find stressful as a trainee is uh, you would speak to people and have the impression that everybody does loads of ruptured aneurysms and is really competent and confident in treating it. But nobody does that many ruptured aneurysms, irrespective of what they tell you. And we'll, we'll cover that data a little bit. The other thing to consider as we go forward is that how you behave in an individual ruptured AAA case may have a more lasting impact uh, than the outcome of the case itself. So uh, a consultant jobs are, are commonly uh, posts that you take on for a long period of time. Commonly, you build up relationships with, with multiple other members of staff. And so consider that when you uh, are trying to manage this fairly stressful situation. So with ruptured aneurysms, I think it's fair to say that history and, and data are not on your side. This is some work uh, done by Matt Bowne and, and the group in Leicester a good number of years ago. And this is looking at the outcome of ruptured aneurysm from published papers over a period of about 50 years. So we might expect, like in many aspects of medicine, that there's a significant improvement with technology, ITU, anesthetics, etc. And what you see here is that really mortality is consistently high uh, from papers published from way back in the 50s all the way up to the 2000s. So the outcome, uh, although it may be improving slightly, is still poor. So this is, you're up against it. Um, of course, we all hope that uh, vascular subspecialization, minimally invasive uh, repairs of uh, uh, ruptured aneurysms would be the answer. But these are some survival curves from uh, the improved study in you know, big centers in the UK. And you can see that the, the mortality figures are still pretty sobering. This is the state of, of play in the UK at the minute. Um, each black dot on this plot represents a, a center that delivers uh, ruptured aneurysm repair. The x-axis is the number of operations they performed between 2016 and 2018, uh, and the y-axis is the in-hospital mortality. And you can see consistently the mortality is in the region of 35%. And of course, what you need to bear in mind here is this is patients that we thought were fit enough to have an operation. So these are the ones potentially that we've selected out as inverted commas winners. So go back to a point I made earlier. Um, each of the black dots is a vascular center. I work at Addenbrooke's. Uh, this is our black dot. And you can see that we are amongst the highest volume providers of uh, repair of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, and at the moment, we're the only center that is an outlier for good outcomes. So even in that high volume center with relatively good outcomes, that equates to three or four ruptures per year, given the number of surgeons that we have. And what we typically find is for reasons that I can't explain, we have little runs. So we may have three or four ruptures in a month or two and then uh, not be involved necessarily for a good number of months. So while this is a really uh, significant problem for us, it's not something that we see that often. So I think it's important as you go into your consultant career, it's something you think about on a regular basis and you plan for, even if you ultimately are not involved in that many cases per annum. The other thing to mention is that the number of aneurysms is going down nationally and this trend may continue. So if we go back to the, the sort of title for the talk, um, building a team approach, I, th I think, what does this mean? Well, I think it probably means you need to think about how you can utilize the personnel around you to give both yourself and your patient the best chance of, of, of a good outcome in this you know, fairly mortal condition. And ultimately this normally means selecting the right patient, delivering the repair as quickly as possible. And of course, minim minimizing the chances of error that can harm uh, the patient uh, uh, and ultimately yourself. 
And talking about errors in aortic surgery or, or any surgery that we perform is typically quite difficult, isn't it? Um, we all like to consider ourselves as conscientious, capable surgeons. And talking about our mistakes, it, it, it has historically been quite difficult and something that we've not done that well. But Colin and his, his team have uh, tr tried to look at this in a more systematic fashion, in a data-driven fashion. It was the, ob the observational study called The Landscape of Error in Aortic Procedures. That was published, I think, a couple of years ago now. But I think, surprisingly to me, on average for elective aortic procedures, so not emergency aortic procedures, elective uh, uh, aortic procedures, there are approximately three failures, which is quite a harsh term, I think, but three errors per aortic procedure performed uh, in major UK centres. And to a certain extent, I find that shocking. Um, but then when you look at the actual errors and uh, failures that are reported, they are all things that are common. They're all things that I've seen, all things that I recognize. So uh, the types of errors reported are equipment. So not having the equipment you need. I'm sure everybody's seen that. Um, the equipment that you have not working as you wanted it to. I'm sure you've all seen that. I'm certain that everybody has seen these procedure independent pressures. So that is things like beds, things like the bleep continually going off for your registrar who's helping you in theater and various other external procedures. Communication errors, I think uh, undoubtedly we all see those uh, and probably they are particularly important and we'll come on to those. But these, uh, although it seems shocking to me, these are all things that I'm familiar with. And I, I guess the key question is, do these failures, do these errors uh, contribute to outcome? And certainly in this relatively small sample, it appears that a higher number of errors is correlated with a higher risk of adverse outcomes, both post-operative death, complications and return to theatre. So if we consider that we have three failures per aortic procedure in an elective setting, uh, it would seem uh, likely to me that in the emergency setting, the, these errors are potentially more frequent and uh, potentially more damaging. So there probably is room for improvement. And again, talking about errors, we're all familiar with this blame cascade that we see after a bad outcome. We often uh, point to deficiencies with the anesthetic. We point to deficiencies in the emergency department in recognizing the uh, rupture quickly enough. We point to issues with theater staff, ITU. Sometimes we even blame the registrar. And uh, if none of them are plausible at all, then we do end up blaming the patient, either their anatomy or their physiology. But ultimately, although all these things that we point to may contribute to our outcomes, they often lead back to uh, ourselves as being the, the sort of individual or the team that leads uh, these interventions. So, of course, if your anaesthetic colleagues are uh, not, not familiar with the results of the IMPROVE trial, potentially you could have been uh, presenting that to them more frequently and more often. If your A&E team are not picking up that the 65-year-old with loin pain may be a ruptured aneurysm, you're probably not engaging in enough ongoing education. Again, Colin's group have tried, I think, to, uh, to capture this, to capture what we think uh, about the errors uh, that lead to preventable harms in, in arterial surgery. And, and many of these themes are common. So it's to do with personnel, it's to do with equipment, it's to do with system uh, pressures. So I suppose the key question is, how, how do we start addressing some of these issues? Is it even possible to address these issues in, in a scenario such as ruptured aneurysms, which uh, clearly are time dependent, happen in the middle of the night and are not that frequent? Uh, how do we do that? Is simulation the answer? Well, I guess there are some emerging data that uh, uh, certainly in elective repair, um, a, a pre-procedure rehearsal where everybody involved in the surgery goes through exactly what you want to do in very granular detail. There is some data that that will reduce the number of errors during that surgery and potentially reduce screening time and contrast usage, which are, are indirect outcomes of or indir indirect measures of how successful and how efficient the procedure may be. What about in ruptured aneurysms? Well, 
obviously a, a pre uh, a pre op rehearsal is pretty difficult in that situation. But this study from fin Finland, um, effectively, this centre instituted a, a simulation on a regular basis for uh, ruptured aneurysm, and this was. The simulation of a consultant surgeon receiving uh, a referral for a patient with uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, and they essentially went through every step that would be required from accepting the referral to getting the patient to ED, getting the patient from ED to the CT scanner and to theatre, getting all the blood tests, the consent, the equipment, Everything that you might do to get the patient into theatre is simulated on, an, a, 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 on a regular basis. And it only takes, I think, an hour. Um, and what they found was that after they uh, instituted this uh, simulation or um, pl planning exercise, there was certainly improved staff confidence. The whole procedure of getting the patient to theatre was much quicker. And they also reported some potential improvement in 30-day outcomes, so really the numbers are very small, so I'm not sure we can hang our hats on that. But it's certainly an interesting paper, and when I think about the complexity of the intervention that we deliver, the rarity, the amount of equipment, equipment that we need, it's, it certainly seems to make sense, and it's not something that, that we do, and I'm not, something, I'm not sure that it's something that's routinely done in the UK. So I think... Um, just at this point, I thought I might break and particularly bring in Colin, but other uh, panel members to discuss potentially the, the state of the art in simulation training, the state of the art in system factors contributing to outcomes in vascular surgery, uh, and really bring in the thoughts of, of the experts, to be honest. Uh, thank you very much, Seamus. That was um an excellent start and there's lots to think about actually in what you first said i think that um uh i was going to give a few I'll, I'll give a few thoughts first then shall i and then we can ask uh waka and uh meryl to join in if you have got any questions or any points that you want raising from the audience then put it into the q a box and i will support your question once we've had a little bit of a uh uh, a chat around it. I guess um, uh, what um, what you said about um, simulation and about going through the whole entire procedure is is very relevant. I think. I think you you actually said the good, the best reason for it at the start is that you said managing the team around you is possibly the most difficult part of the procedure and uh, it's certainly the most difficult part of the procedure in going from being a registrar to a consultant all of a sudden someone isn't dealing with all the technical bits for you and you're left there trying to sort out all the technical bits and all of the uh, retraction of the right areas and doing the anastomosis and organizing everyone around you it can be a, a, a challenge and I think that practicing and making sure all of these bits get together is is very important. We looked. We are keen on simulation because um, we obviously have used it as a in, in a research capacity for a while. We've been keen on it in Imperial, and we've got the uh, the infrastructure to be able Brilliant. to do it and the expertise around, which is good. Um, we looked at. Um, we looked at first of all about how you might do it and you can you can get a very good uh, idea of the different steps of the procedure on with a simple model you can get a very a very good idea and uh, of the technical skill related in some of the parts of the of the procedure using a virtual reality model on a bench but if you want to do everything that Seamus has been talking about and looking at errors in terms of of, of um, simulation and managing your team around you and your communication and, and getting rid of all of these errors or in practicing in that entire procedure to be able to try and get your door to operation time uh, that uh, that reduced as they did in Finland, at Pekka did in Finland. It's uh, it's important that you try and simulate things with an immersive simulation. You can do it in a theatre, um, which has uh, with doing downtime during a theatre, but that may and may be more and more difficult as you get 
um, as you get more pressure to utilize theaters more often in three session days, perhaps. Um, or you can do it in a fully immersive simulation lab, which we were lucky enough to try out in. We looked at um, validity in terms of face validity and content validity and ruptured aneurysm scenarios. We set up some ruptured aneurysm scenarios for people and teams. Uh, it takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of manpower. But when you went in and did it, even if you designed the whole thing yourself, you still felt like you were you had a real person in front of you with the bleeping and the noise and the Neith just shouting at you and the team around you and everyone making those normal errors. So you can make it very realistic and you can learn an awful lot from it. We did, we've done lots of controlled trials looking at simulation um, where we've tried to identify teaching leadership, tried to identify teaching team skills and the way that people uh, work with each other and with communication. And it certainly is possible. They're all pre post studies and it's very difficult to get an idea of whether it makes a difference whether it's just continuing doing the same thing that makes a difference or whether it's a simulation it's very difficult to prove clinical outcomes I would dearly love to do it and I've spent probably the last five years trying to the block to do things from that point of view and I'd hope that you could but I think there is emerging evidence that simulation does work in some uh, some larger scale um projects and I think that it's certainly very well received by people and certainly fulfills those Kirkpatrick learning levels of one two three and maybe we're getting to four um, uh, and um, I would fully support it but not everyone is quite the same uh, I wonder whether Merrill and Wackar have got anything else to add to to um, simulation experience and how useful you think it is Yes, I mean, Colin, so we, we did run uh, a very uh, successful course at the college, and I can testify to your acting as well uh, in that course. So, uh, <laughs> very good, yes. Asking this question. So yes, uh, uh, the whole idea is not, it's about making sure that all the members of your team, and particularly uh, those members who may not be regularly involved with uh, your elective activities, have an opportunity to share the entire journey, entire pathway, and all the challenges that you are experiencing as a surgeon leading that process yourself. So uh, the course ran very successfully at the college, and then we took it out to Addenbrooke's, where uh, I think team from Bedford and other uh, neighboring hospitals came. And the whole idea is that you can um, involve, you know, um, radiographers, ODP, everybody else who are working with you in this process. And if somebody wants to organize that on a Saturday in their hospital, then I'm sure the resources can be shared with them. But one particular point about simulation is about rehearsal. And as the team leader, as a surgeon who is supposed to lead the whole process, you need to rehearse the entire episode in your mind over and over again. And that is the key. So I think, you know, how do you train yourself as a surgeon? to become a good and effective leader or an operator for that matter. I think it's thinking about the whole process, thinking about the small things that get overlooked, thinking about who's going to get what, where are the graphs, who is going to you know, bring it to theaters, who is doing the measurement, who is organizing hematology uh, uh, and everything else. And you need to rehearse that in your mind that that's something you can do over and over again without any technical input, without any particular simulation facility. Um, uh, but again, you know, in your own organization, if you want to organize something, then I think a Saturday or a day when the theaters are not being used and people are free, it's a great opportunity. And you can also link it to, for example, trauma services and other IR interventions because they're all linked. They all have a similar process, similar sort of manpower required to make these things happen. So you can work with the other team members to make it a more successful event in your organization, but rehearsal, thinking about the whole process, thinking about your own role and everybody else's role in your mind over and over again, that's something central to how I go about doing these things. That's some excellent points there. Rehearsal is, is really good uh, term actually to use and you can use it in various different circumstances. I think rehearsal, you're thinking of rehearsing that 
rehearsing in your mind, there's a personal rehearsal, but there's also a rehearsal of a team walking through a whole ruptured part aneurysm pathway. And you can do within there um, mini, uh, mini type of rehearsals, which some people have termed the sterile cockpit. So you, you get to a point in the operation where you have uh, a, a crucial part coming up. You're just about to put the clamp on in the thoracic aorta and you've got 20 minutes or 40 minutes before they almost certainly die from bowel ischemia. You want to rehearse every part of that. You can go through a mental rehearsal with your team at that part of the, the, uh, the, the procedure. It gives them the idea that this is an important part they, that everyone needs to concentrate for that 45 minutes. Meryl. I'd agree entirely. Um, actually, you, you wouldn't believe when we have done rehearsals, um, just what you suddenly find is missing, like there isn't an oxygen cylinder to take the patient up to theatre. You don't suddenly have access to the theatre lifts. Um, the porter, you've sent him off to get bloods ready and you haven't got another porter to help you get up to theatres. So all the silly things that you think couldn't happen you certainly find, and we've done them now with, it's usually an anaesthetist with a camera as the patient on their chest and then just walking through. And they do, it's amazing how immersed people um, go into these um, simulations and actually everyone really welcomes both the debrief afterwards, but also contributing to changing the procedures. And we've got a rupture app because we were finding that there's so much communication that you have to have with so many people that uh, developed a rupture app that just helps to keep everyone in the loop. And it means you don't miss things. So without question, simulation and rehearsals and repeated rehearsals to fine tune it are absolutely essential. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's very interesting, certainly having not been involved terribly in, in simulation. I can tell you a, 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 an honest confession is that when I became a consultant, the bits that I went over my head again and again were putting the clamp on and stitching the top end in. Everything else I really didn't consider. And that is, is in some ways more difficult um, because you can get yourself very upset <laughs> Or you've even got an instrument in your hand um, uh, and you can get your whole team upset before you've got an instrument in your hand, which, which really doesn't help anybody. Um, and I think more and more, the, the more I practice further, you recognize that dealing with all these unforeseen uh, circumstances in a decisive but polite manner is, is almost as effective as being able to deliver the operation in a relatively safe fashion. There are three uh, comments, questions on the Q&A, which I'm going to, I will say now, um, how much involvement of Reboa in ruptured aneurysm, any data please, I'm going to, uh, I'll tell you, I'll answer that in a, in a slightly odd way, in that one thing that is interesting is if you are, uh, there may be a role, of course, for balloon occlusion of the aorta before endovascular therapy. Um, any data, I don't think anyone can really answer. But if you are, this is, this is a, a good opportunity to talk about the relationship between equipment and the team. And uh, Seamus uh, showed some data from the LEAP study looking at the equipment errors. And it, that, all that demonstrates is that vascular surgery now is highly reliant on both um, uh, disposable and non-disposable equipment and and the C arm and all these things that all interacting together. So there's a b bigger potential for failure. And if you are going to start anything like uh, balloon occlusion of the aorta, simulation is a really good way to walk your team through it a number of times to do exactly what Wakar is talking about. Rehearse and rehearse it and, and go on and do it. I don't know if anyone's got any further... Well, I, I, I mean, on balloons, uh, Colin, uh, maybe yeah. in 1996, I designed two types of occlusion balloons for ruptured aneurysm and had prototypes made uh, by Cook, and uh, I never got to use it. Uh, the reason being that by the time you've got the, the, the delay is usually in getting the patient on the table, getting everything set up, having your guide wires and catheters into the aorta. Once you get to that stage, 
you really are in a position to deploy a stent graft as quickly and efficiently. And particularly if you don't want to complicate it, you can use a uni idea graft. So I must say, having thought about this idea and, and actually got some prototypes made for me by, by Cook uh, way back in 1996, specifically for rupture with calibration and, and a balloon that was long enough not to migrate because one of the problems with balloons is they slip down and, and, and I never had the need to use it. So that's, that's one of the points. And also again with open surgery and clamping, by the time you get the patient on table in a position, uh, then I, I personally don't feel that the balloon really adds, it can actually delay the whole process and make the matter more complicated. Yes, I mean, we, we don't really ever, ever use um, balloon occlusion in, in Addenbrooke. And for the reasons that, that Wackar has mentioned, that to get, to get a balloon stabilized, you, you need a big French sheath pretty high up the aorta. And at that point, put your stent graft in. Um, I don't think it's something you can do like Reboa, per se, which is delivered on the street for somebody whose pelvis has been mushed up when it's... It's, it's typically young people with more typically sized iliac vessels. I, I, I don't think that's, I don't think bashing a balloon in an A&E blindly is ever going to be safe or, or, or something that is required. Uh, it didn't go up the right hole either, if you just stick it in blind. How do you train a young vascular surgeon managing with crisis like rapture aneurysm? Well, I think we're going to do more of this technical skills and non-technical and management and leadership. I know, Lamar, this is going to be answered soon. And then Trevor Dale has our, is a human factors specialist, non-clinical and ex-airline for 34 years. So we better behave when we talk about uh, non-technical skills and human factors. Question for him is how many of the failures could have been anticipated and potentially avoided, which is a very interesting question. Um, the definition of failure really within that uh, study, the LEAP study, was that, that they could have in some, in some way been potentially avoided. I guess you, it's a really difficult question to answer. It's always going to be subjective and it always has to be put in the context of the NHS. You might say that every single failure can be uh, uh, avoided and be seen uh, and be and be anticipated if you spent three times as long preparing and had an intensive care team right next to you and all of the all of the things for everyone but you could never do that within the healthcare service perhaps so I think it's very it's very um a uh, very difficult question to answer but uh, the more you see the more that you will uh, teach people the more you'll see the the failure next time i guess uh, and the last question any role for a temporary shunt one aneurysm is being repaired i'm going to park because that's a technical question we might come back to it a bit later if that's all right the rest are coming in and seamus i think we should let you go on with the next bit all right uh, so uh, i mean I, I guess um just moving on from that 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 typically our model has been you do a workshop about ruptured aneurysms, you don't do workshops on a regular basis about uh, uh, ruptured aneurysms. And I suppose you do your workshop, you, you come to a new hospital, you, you recognize you've got some great anesthetists, you've got some great, um, you've got some great, great IR colleagues, uh, a great theater, and you feel in your mind you're, you're a well-oiled uh, a team uh, and you're mentally prepared for the ruptured aneurysm but the, the reality is is what will happen is it'll be new year's eve it'll be three o'clock in the morning uh, your colleagues may not be easily accessible uh, the anatomy of the aneurysm will be terribly difficult the, the the team you have on with you will not be the the sort of crack team of specialists that you, you thought you might have on with you uh you may have a, a, a new IR that you've never never worked with. You may have, rather than your uh, you, you know your vascular anaesthetist who knows all the data, you may have the guy who likes putting epidurals and on these on call once every six months. You probably won't have your uh, hybrid theatre team with you, and, and so to a certain extent, uh, the best laid plans in the NHS uh, don't always 
it doesn't always transpire as you expect it will. Uh, and certainly this, this quote uh, is to a certain extent how I felt in the first rupture that I treated when I became a consultant. And in reality, within the NHS, having, ha having a bespoke aortic team on call for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, I, d I don't mean just a surgeon who likes fixing aortas, I mean a whole team, is probably not practicable. And certainly having routine and regular simulations within the context of the NHS where you might need to use you know, the valuable theater time may not be practicable. So in reality, it's in this situation when nothing's gone as you had imagined it might. This is really when your leadership skills, your communication, and your ability to deliver this operation is probably tested to its max. Obviously, if there's a nice simple aneurysm that comes in on a Monday morning and you can bump into your hybrid theater with the elective team, that's nice, but often that's not the case. And so surgical leadership is one of these, uh, to me, quite nebulous and difficult to define qualities that we all observe uh, during our training with various different forms of, of leadership and communication in, in various different situations. But I would encourage you, if, if you have a moment, to look at this document produced by the College of Surgeons a couple of years ago, which I think actually go some of the way to defining both some, some admirable leadership qualities, but what I actually found was more useful that they, they highlighted some behaviors that, that would not be considered good leadership. And they're probably, again, things that you might recognize from your day-to-day -day practice. But if I just highlight some sort of passages from it, I think they're, they're, they're perhaps worth, worth bearing in mind as we go forward. Um, so, so how do we effectively define leadership in a surgical context? Well, clearly defined leadership roles, and this is, this is relevant in a rupture. Um, a leadership style that is appropriate to the clinical situation, and that's something that we'll, we'll talk about in a little more detail. The ability to give clear direction uh, as the leader to what is quite a big and often complex and distracted team. Other factors they point to are continuous seeking of input from other team members and engaging members uh, in team-based decision-making. Now, while I can see that these are relevant for surgical leadership in general, I think that in a rupture situation, given the time-dependent nature and, and the often sort of crash-bang wallop of, of the situation, there are a couple of points here that are, that are very relevant. Uh, particularly that you have a leadership style is, that is appropriate to the clinical situation, which is obviously a grave clinical situation, and that you are able to give clear direction to your team. So to me, this is something that I do rehearse, what I'm going to say to the different members of my team and how I'm going to direct them, because what's obvious to you is not always obvious to them. This is another little uh, sort of quote, which I, which I think is, is, is quite useful. Um, surgery is not a solitary act. The success of any individual surgeon is no longer dependent on him or her as the lone captain of the ship. The notion of the heroic leader is outdated and inappropriate in a modern health service. Safe, effective surgery is team-based with accountability and empowerment being more distributed across the team than invested in one individual leader. Now, I have to be completely honest, when I read this, I was somewhat disappointed, as I do like the captain of the ship uh, analogy. However, I think ruptured aneurysms are one clinical situation where a slightly more didactic management style and leadership style may be appropriate. And we'll talk about that in a little more, but this is just something to sort of bear in mind going forward. So specifically, some leadership qualities are uh, described in, in, in that document, and I think they are relevant to managing ruptured aneurysms. The first is effective communication, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in some detail. The second is being able to empower members of your team with specific tasks. Skill and decisiveness are, are, are somewhat nebulous and, and difficult to define, but we'll consider them jointly. And finally, openness, uh, which we'll talk about. And the concept of contextual leadership skills, uh, the, 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 
a better analogy than airlines for me is sports, um, because airlines to me seem very well controlled, um, very predictable. Uh, whereas sports are, are the, the opposite; they're they're unpredictable and uh, difficult to to to, to uh, know exactly what's going to happen. But when I think about some sporting leaders, you know, I think about Roy Keane was a fantastic, uh, a fantastic leader on the field, but his behaviour towards his teammates and, and his management was often uh, not great. And that, that led to ultimately him having problems in his career. Some of you may remember Phil de Glanville. I mean, he was a wonderful England captain, but the problem was he wasn't particularly good at rugby. So although he was able to lead and communicate pretty well, he wasn't, he wasn't able to, de to deliver the job he was expected to do. And then one leader I do, uh, I do have an awful lot of respect for is MS Dhoni. He's very calm, very cool, collected, and works well under pressure. And sometimes I think he would be a pretty good model for us. Anyway, um, leadership qualities, communication. How do we think about communication? Um, well, well, simply, good communication in a rupture starts the minute you get the initial referral. So most of our referrals are from uh, spoke hospitals, typically 45 minutes or an hour away. And typically there are A&E doctors that you do not know uh, and you don't have any working relationship and that's difficult. So from, from the get-go, you need to think about your communication, you need to think about the questions you need to ask the referring hospitals in order to make a plan. Once you've received the referral, I think you need to consider who you need to speak to, and we'll, we'll come on to it in a slide, but typically when I'm dealing with a rupture, I'm making multiple telephone calls, many more than I would have thought uh, when, when starting out. Uh, when you're doing a rupture, there is a tendency to want to get on with it immediately. And that's understandable because the patient's bleeding and you need to get the operation started as quickly as possible. However, I would encourage you to, to, to really brief the team fully and do a team brief as you would for an elective case and be absolutely clear with the team what you expect of them uh, and what you're expecting to do with the procedure. Another communication skill that sometimes we forget is to warn people early. So if you have a referral from a spoke hospital, you need to alert your hospital to the fact that this patient is coming. That means alerting theatres, ITU, anaesthetics, uh, and the emergency department. And what I've said to you before, what's obvious to you in communication is not always obvious to everybody. A final point when thinking about how you communicate and how you get on with getting things done, all ruptures are stable until they're not. So, so, so we often get patients who arrive who seem to be in a pretty good state when they arrive and they fall off their perch very, very quickly. So even if a patient's stable, treat this as an emergency. A rupture is a rupture is a rupture. So who do you need to speak to? Well, these are people that I have had fairly strained conversations with. Um, when trying to get ruptures into the hospital and up to theatre. So you find yourself talking to bed managers, you find yourself talking to the image transfer team when the CT scans haven't arrived. You even sometimes find, find yourself trying to sweet talk porters to get them to get the patient to CT or, or to theatre very quickly. So you have to have in your mind a grid of who you need to speak to in your hospital to get things done. There's no point in doing it on the hoof because you'll miss things. I think a really important part of leadership and communication ruptured aneurysms is selecting the appropriate patient to treat. And we all know this is an imperfect science. There are a variety of predictive tools around to give you an idea of the likelihood of success. But often this is a judgment that you have to make pretty rapidly in a resource department. Of course, we all want to save everybody. And of course, we, we, we think generally that we can deliver uh, you know, fairly difficult operations um, safely and effectively. But the reality is we have to accept some ruptures are inoperable. Some aortas are inoperable. And some patients, although they may have an operable uh, aneurysm, are, 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 are unsalvageable. And I think you have to be able to recognize that and you have to be able to communicate that. Uh, and before you embark upon any uh, rupture, I think you need to consider the, the, the appropriateness of what you're uh, suggesting. Uh, and you have to also consider you may have personal biases. You may you know, prefer doing an open repair. You may prefer doing um, 
endovascular. You may have skills that, that push you down one road, but you need to consider that when deciding upon the appropriateness of the, the repair that you're offering. The, the, the point I think I may have made already is that the heroic failure, you know, really trying to salvage an unsalvageable patient rarely feels heroic and, and often has quite a negative impact upon both you and your team. I think the turning patients down does require <coughs> leadership, but I think this is not something that you necessarily want to do on your own. Uh, very commonly, I will ask for a second opinion. We've got Paddy on the line here. Very commonly, I will speak to him, even if he's not on call and it's late at night, if I have a difficult decision to make. Very commonly, I will involve the consultant anaesthetist in the decision and even sometimes the ED do doctors because very often they have input and they see things in a slightly different fashion to what we do. So don't be afraid to ask for help uh, and recognize that turning down patients and making the correct decision is a form of leadership, even if ultimately uh, it has, uh, you know, the, the rupture ends up being fatal for your patient. So as I've alluded to earlier, that we, we are a high volume center and we have good outcomes for the time being for ruptured aneurysms. But I can tell you in the five or so years I've been working at Attenbrooks, I have seen a number of examples of poor communication in patients with ruptured aneurysm. And I think it's always useful to share with you some of the mistakes that I've seen and I've been involved with. Um, as as uh, I've alluded to, I've seen patients turning up that we've accepted from uh, uh, external hospitals uh, and the RED has not been warned about the patient and they've turned up in the recess. That is r rarely goes down well and doesn't allow your hospital to prepare for this patient and therefore will cause some delay in getting them to theatre. Along the same note, I've seen patients being wheeled straight up to theatre without the theatres being told. And again, this never goes down well because they don't have the operating theatre. They do not have the equipment ready for you. So however keen you are to get to the operating theatre, make sure you communicate early. Make sure you let people know exactly what you want to do and exactly what you need as early as possible. I've seen people getting irritated, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, getting very irritated with the anaesthetic team because they're taking too long to put in the arterial line or the central line, and you're just desperate to get on with the operation. Conflict at this point is not helpful. Of course, you can discuss with them about the time that it's taking, but getting into an argument gets you nowhere. Again, I've seen uh, you know, tr trivial arguments between staff about consent forms. Um, patients being rushed up to theatre and the consent form one or the consent form four has not been adequately filled out. Think about this at an early stage. Have this in the algorithm in your head that you rehearse. It's much easier to have your consent form appropriately filled out, either as a consent form four or as a consent form one. It makes life easier for everybody. I've seen radiographers being the last to know in patients that were taken for an emergency EVAR. Um, I've seen induction starting of patients with a ruptured aneurysm before the surgeon's scrubbing and the sort of predictable collapse that you get uh, before the surgeon has their gloves on. And I've also seen a case where we uh, started an open repair, but we had uh, an EVAR table which has no attachment for an Omnitract. So these are all pretty you know, major errors that potentially could, could, could have a, a, an impact upon the patient's outcome. And when things are difficult, really have in your mind at an early stage these simple, simple steps that need to be followed and rehearse them as we discussed earlier. So this is just a couple of cases. Well, it's a similar case to presented two different ways that I thought we could put back to the panel. Um, this is, uh, and, and particularly what I want to discuss with the panel and for them to discuss with the audience is not uh, what you would do with this aneurysm, but what your strategy for communication is, who you think you need to speak to. So the first case, an 89 year old man, very frail, with quite advanced COPD and a limited exercise tolerance, has come into your hospital with a ruptured aneurysm. He's sort of lost consciousness in the ambulance, but is now talking and fairly drowsy. We can see a picture of a CT scan here. And the purpose of this CT is to demonstrate that his aneurysm is not suitable for a, a conventional... So I'm not sure if somebody asked me something or was that... No. I can't see your PowerPoint, uh, Shrimps. Right, yeah. Um, 
So the, the, the purpose of the PowerPoint is, uh, so the purpose of the CT scan is to show you that this is an aneurysm that's not suitable for a conventional EVAR in a very frail elderly patient. So we we'll just go to the panel. Tell me what sort of conversations you would be having and with whom in your hospital. Right, I'm the chair, so I get to decide. Meryl, why don't you <laughs> go first? Um, uh, Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. So my, um, I've written down um, who would I be speaking to. So um, in in the emergency department, because of the way our rupture call occurs, we already uh, around waiting for the patient. Hopefully, we'll have um, the anaesthetist, the um, part team, so the um, intensive care team, and we'll have ED registrar plus or minus consultant. So. Um, and the, I'm glad Shane brought this up of temporary loss of consciousness. It's a little bit like, oh, patient's been peri arrest or has had a little bit of an arrest, but he came back very quickly. Um, with all of that on board, um, we've got the phrase, not everybody has to die having had a cut in their groin or down their abdomen. Um, so I would be trying to sway um, the team and the patient that perhaps this is a step too far and um, perhaps offering a ruptured aneurysm repair in this gentleman is not appropriate. And we've got that phrase of once we've had, say, a, say a CT scan done, we have a, a pause to make anyone aware or to have that, do we still want to proceed with a rupture? We just have that gap where anaesthetists and other members of the team can contribute it doesn't have to be a long mdt it is just a pause are we doing the right thing do we proceed and uh, your anaesthetic team will take an active part in that decision making process yes yeah. yeah. I, I think i think you said two things there i think you've said that that pause as a team and discussion as a team is really, really important. And I think that is a very important thing to take away from this. And the second thing was doing it as a team, as Seamus has, has, has put together, your anaesthetic team need to take a part of this, but you know in your heart what is the right thing to do. I think the mistake in this case is to say, oh, let's see what the anaesthetic or ITU team say and send them off to see the family who then, don't really give an answer and then you're left with a very sticky situation that you then have to sort out from the very beginning again. So I, I agree with Meryl. I think that's a lovely way of doing it. I think having it as a, as a structured thing that you do is really neat and something we can all learn from. Waka? I, I agree entirely. I mean, you must, you must uh, uh, involve your... Glass of water when you came home and you didn't even drink it. Oh. They, they are very important uh, partners in, in the decision making process, and it does take on responsibility in a shared manner. I mean, when I was training, you called your consultant in Nottingham, this is 25, 30 years ago. One of them would say, How old is the patient? 80 years old and above? He would say, No. The other would say, If the patient is talking, go ahead and do the operation. Now, these are difficult decisions, and particularly now with local anesthetic EVAR, there is a temptation to push the boundaries, but remember the quality of life, even if the patient survives at that sort of age, is going to be extremely poor. And, uh, and so you need to think very carefully in an 89-year-old, I wish you could see the slide, it's a dextrorenal aneurysm, Seamus. And, uh, uh, so you can't see the slides? No, I can't. I can. Anyway, okay. okay. Maybe it's my my. Anyway, sorry. Apologize. So yes, uh, uh, resist the temptation because you know, uh, with you are in particular, there is a temptation to treat patients who are very elderly and frail, and you're actually not serving their best interest. But do have the benefit of the anaesthetist. Uh, they can join you. They must join you in the recess to see these patients anyway to make a decision regardless, and make a joint decision with the ED physician, as Meryl has said. It avoids a lot of unhappiness among sometimes, you know, the nurses who may be looking after these patients, uh, who may not recognize that, uh, uh, you know, operation was going to be futile. 
So yes, involve others in the decision making, but resist the temptation to push the boundaries too far in the frail and elderly because it doesn't help them. I, I, I agree entirely. That's how that's how we do it in in general. Um, we have a low threshold for calling another consultant vascular surgeon. If it's, I mean, this is obviously. Uh, a fairly clear cut case. They're obviously not always so clear cut and the decision making can be difficult. But um, from a defensive point of view, of course, people, people are increasingly litigious and families can be difficult to manage. And I think the more people you have contributing to the decision, even frankly, if you've made the decision and you're quite confident in it, the, the more support you have in that process, uh, it both empowers your colleagues, but it also helps you. Excellent. Oh, we've got some points that I hadn't seen on the chat. The last two of which I've, I've got here are very interesting. Um, Paddy uh, asks the panellists, Seamus, Wacker, um, uh, Merrill, what about when turning down a patient who is in a spoke? Should we have been transferring all ruptures to the hub to eyeball them in inverted commas? And that's a very interesting question. What does everyone think about that? Seamus, you can answer first. Uh, I mean, it's, it's probably, it, it's, a, it's a major issue for us um, because you're balancing the appropriateness of transferring somebody who is you know, very elderly toward the end of their life and potentially spending their last couple of hours in an ambulance and then in Addenbrooke's rather than being wherever they've, they've been referred from. Um, and there, I don't think I have a, a correct answer for this, except if there is any doubt from the referring team about what they think is appropriate, I think the only thing you can do is accept the patient uh, and, as, you, as Paddy says, eyeball them your, uh, yourself. We, we, of course, have referrals for very elderly people from ED teams who are very confident that an operation would not be in the patient's best interest. Uh, my, in my personal view is that I wouldn't transfer that patient, but we don't have a unit, we don't have a unit policy, uh, which is probably why Paddy's asked that difficult question. Uh, but um, <laughs> I, I'd be interested to hear what other pe how other people deal with that scenario. I mean, we have five, five, five spoke hospitals in our network and exactly the same difficulty. If there is absolute clarity in your conversation with the referring emergency physician and you can agree quite happily that the patient is too frail and the transfer will be inappropriate and it's going to be futile, then that's fine. But if there is a difficulty in reaching an agreement, then you must, you have to follow the path of least resistance. And, and sadly, in many cases, it's, it's not the right thing for the patient to be tra traveling in an ambulance in the last hour of their life. But but I'm afraid that uh, you know you can't enter into a conflict and resistance because these hospitals would have lost their vascular services. They feel slightly bereft without their vascular on call, etc. So sadly, that is a reality of the you know the modern vascular provision that patients will be transferred. Sometimes you may have to see them and then palliate them in your own um, hub. That does happen from time to time. Meryl, do you have a role? No, we don't have a rule. Um, I wish many. I wish it would be easier. Um, as Andy has said, as a comment, you know, sometimes we we're transferring patients um, away from families and their nearest and dearest, and they and sadly we then turn them down and they die in a foreign hospital to without their family often. Um, so it's not. It is difficult. I agree. Um, I, I think. Very rarely do we go out um, to another hospital. Um, sometimes trainees ask that question as to should we be travelling to go and do an open aneurysm in another hospital? And generally the answer is absolutely not. The patient comes to us. Uh, I'd agree with everything that's said. All we, all, we can look at the CT scan and give the person the other end the ammunition to speak to the family and the patient and say, this is not a... a this." on the right hand, left hand side of the screen is not something that we're going to have a quick fix for. It would only be an open operation and it's really inappropriate. But if they need to come and die in a vascular centre 
and the family need to know that they've been considered and been given the opportunity to have the best out of the best operation they could have been, then so be it in my, my book. Well, Someone has asked. I is, comment on that, Colin, if I may, about transfer and, and CT. So one of the questions that come up, uh, should you be asking this referring hospital to do the CT scan or should you transfer them? Uh, our policy is to encourage them to do the CT scan locally for several reasons. One, as you point out, it may be an untreatable aneurysm in an 88-year-old man, so you can make that decision with the benefit of information from the CT. And also you have ample time to then prepare and plan when the images have been transferred as the patient is coming your way. So I think you need to have a formalized process where patients in the spoke hospital get a CT scan there and then are transferred or not transferred. I've got one, I've got one question which is very relevant. Is eyeball te- can your eyeball test be done using a video call? with ED staff. I've never done it, but I, I'm, uh, and three months ago, I would have said, no, don't be stupid. But actually now I'm sure it's very possible to do and may well be part of what we do. Um, in, in East, the, the regionalised East Anglia stroke service, there is uh, the provision for patients with potential strokes that could be lysed. They are looked at by the, the Addenbrooke stroke team who can, can advise the, the spoke hospitals on whether this patient fits the, fits the bill for lysis, as it were. Um, but I, I guess the, the difficulty is there are rarely ruptured aneurysms who look, who look well. <laughs> they, they tend to generally look pretty terrible. Um, and, and given how I look on this Zoom consultation, I, I, I think it would be very difficult to do the eyeball test um, r- remotely. Yeah, um, I'd be turning you down right now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, but but uh, I, so, so I, I, think, um, I think that's interesting, but I, it's not something I can say that we'll be doing anytime soon for, for this scenario. Okay, we're inundated with with stuff with um uh, comments and questions but uh, and i'll just give you two that are relevant andy garland said it's a long way to come for palliative care away from your family and i think that's a real important thing that we need to remember keith jones often a and e are shocked when you palliate ask them if they have a living will and that's a very relevant question so i thought we should say it um i'm gonna gather together all the rest of the questions um uh, Seamus, I think you should carry on with your talk. Well, I don't want to delay you so long. Well, in, in fact, in fact, the next I wanted to keep on the panel because um, oh. I've just changed the scenario, the same CT scan, but but changed the scenario. And this is a the point in this scenario is this is a go. <laughs> so we've got a young, relatively young, sixty-five, the same aneurysm, same CT scan. So it's 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 hostile. It's not suitable for endovascular aneurysm repair, but now we have a younger, fitter person in whom this, this has happened. And I think, as you said earlier, Colin, this is an open repair or, or, or nothing. So if we go back to the panel and, and you're, let, let's put you in the situation of being a first year consultant um, in the ED and, and, and this presents What's your communication strategy now? Who are you speaking to? And um, who are you telling in your team to speak to people, etc.? So, you know, Wakar, Merrill, whoever well, wants to take I'm, that on. I, I will have absolutely no hesitation in calling one of my other vascular surgical colleague um, quickly because it's likely to be a difficult operation. Ruptures die regardless, even if things go well. And you can see this is a challenging anatomy and, uh, and it will be a complex emergency repair. So perhaps, you know, I would uh, communicate with one of my colleagues quite early on. And, and, and as, you know, as a rule, we all look after each other. So there should be no hesitation in doing that. And, and, and you will get help. I'm sure in any department, somebody will be there who will come and help you. So the first, the first call is to, to someone to try and get some technical help with you. Meryl, how, what about you? <laughs> your first call. But how does your Rupture app, app work as well, I think, is important, isn't it, with all these people that we need to communicate? Yeah, so actually um, we'd have at least 
I wouldn't say two surgeons alerted to um, this gentleman, um, whether and, uh, to be it either day or night. So I think that's actually very helpful. Um, we've got an aortic team. Um, I, if you looked at, and the, the question might arise, but um, I can't imagine it would be a scenario where a, if there was a problem higher up, let's assume, let's don't complicate it, let's assume it's a, it's a juxta renal. Um, it, you're gonna have to put clamps above the, of the renals, plus or minus, to get access in the first instance, a supraceliac clamp. And I think that's one thing that I don't think we teach enough is that to stop, stop the bleeding is consider putting um, a supraceliac clamp on and then consider moving it down. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to muddy the water and say, oh, is there a fenestrated off the, off the shelf device that we can use in this scenario? I'm not gonna go down that line, um, but it's definitely phone a friend and that friend needs to be in theater with you. So I would disagree. Well, I wouldn't disagree at all. It's all what, what you've said is very important. I think one of the most important people in this situation, though, is a proper um, vascular anaesthetist. And so one of my first phone calls will be to, or first visits will be to theatre, to make sure that um, the the anaesthetic and the team that are going to be dealing with it are have do regular vascular they're going to be used to a supraceliac clamp for 25 minutes if we're lucky 45 minutes if we're not and that they are going to be able to set up the cell saver and do all those other things that we would do for that just to be you know type four approach that we're going to use to try and get that aneurysm fixed but it's sometimes quite difficult and you, you quite often are doing the phone calls and you start with the anaesthetist and then by the time you've gone to an anaesthetist blood bank blah 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 you've got the itu on the phone saying why haven't you told me about the rupture and you're saying well i'm actually you know i'm trying to get through them all and i think that's it just takes us back to leadership and you need to deploy people in the right way to go and talk to different people uh, depending on what it looks like and so i I would do the talking with the anaesthetist myself I would send someone else to tell ITU that they're getting someone with a rupture and they're 65 and they haven't got any choice and they just got to sort it out that sort of thing but I think equally even though this gentleman is 65 I think that um it's it's we'd have a we'd probably be having quite a different conversation now um if we said he's he's had an arrest already um but even that loss of consciousness or um heart failure or peri-arrest situation, that's a poor prognostic sign for any, any patient, irrespective of the age, I would suggest. I mean, I, I, I think probably, we can, I mean, that's exactly what you've said is exactly what, well, I'm, I'm glad you said it because it's exactly what, what I would have said. Um, and, and, and the key takeaway point, Ben, is you, you, it is leadership to phone a colleague immediately. It is leadership to ask a senior anaesthetist for help. All these things are, are not a sign of weakness. They're a sign of uh, understanding the pathology and understanding uh, how these repairs work. I think probably we can move on there. I think uh, unless, Colin, there's anything specific that you want to say. Um, I'm just desperately trying to work through questions and comments and things like that. Uh, uh, Someone said, "What about the what is the plan in a sixty-five-year-old with COPD and life-limiting activity, an eighty-nine-year-old fit with ruptured aneurysm in the same scenario?" These are very difficult questions, and probably that grey area in between. I, I think we have to. If, if there was a, you know, I, I've typically put in scenarios that probably only have one answer. Um, that, yeah, that, that I don't think any of us can hand on heart give give an answer. To, to those questions because uh, and in, in fact they are more in our in our hands they are more common scenarios fit elderly people and extremely unfit young people that they're the two groups that we tend to see and it is extremely difficult and i i don't think i can give you uh, very very much of an answer other than i go and see the patient and try and make a, a nuanced decision as best i can uh, I entirely agree with you. I think uh, there's some there's some lots of moaning about uh, IT skills, and I, I I'm with you. Whoever's uh, telling me about pack systems, but anyway, shameless carry on. So so what about empowerment um, as one of our key leadership skills? Because 
yeah, as I sort of alluded to, I suspect we all quite like the captain of the ship analogy and, 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 and I'm in charge and, you know, this is, this is what I've trained for, et cetera. But you do have a number of people around you and those people around you all have a defined skill set. And I would encourage you to consider the skill set that is around you and how you can empower them. Um, as we've already discussed, pre-op selection, which is a key, you know, an absolute key facet of successful repair, it, it is, is more than just an eyeball test from yourself. You should involve colleagues. Um, the relationship with the anaesthetist is, is t generally very straightforward if it's one of your vascular anaesthetists and, you know, it, it discusses management of complex aortas with you on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's much more difficult when you have the anaesthetist, as I alluded to earlier, who, who specializes in chronic pain and doesn't do many uh, major vascular procedures. Um, and, and, and I think you have to be extremely clear about how you want to proceed. So if you're doing... Uh, an EVAR and you want to do it under local anaesthetic, you have to be extremely clear with them the, the rationale for that because surprisingly, anaesthetists are not always mad keen on you doing a, a local anaesthetic case. Um, that said, there is a line um, and, and, and I think that trying to tell the, the, the anaesthetist how, how to anaesthetize the patient, when to anaesthetize the patient, uh, uh, you, it's a line you probably don't want to cross, but you do need to be absolutely crystal clear in your communication with your anaesthetist and don't expect that every anaesthetist knows the improved data, knows how to deal with ruptures, knows that you want to be scrubbed with the patient prepped, etc., before they induce the patient. Don't expect that they know all that. Um, I, th I think it's important not to sort of throw your hands up and say this is a rupture all normal practices go out the window. As I said earlier, do your team brief, all your normal theatre etiquette, how you speak to your theatre staff, do all that as you would for an elective case. Um, and it's extremely important, particularly overnight when, when you might not know all the staff. So I think it's fair to say that you can be the dominant voice in the room and be confident in your own abilities, but respect and empower those around you. Also think about roles for, for, for things that I've mentioned. Who is going to organize the, the cross match? Who is going to put the catheter in? Who's going to shave the groins if you want to shave the groins? Who is going to do the consent form? Um, have all these in your mind as a checklist of what needs to be done for the rupture before they get to theater and have a decision as to who's going to do them. Uh, and if you can empower somebody else to do it, then do. I think skill and decisiveness is, is uh, I don't really know how to encompass these because these are listed as, as leadership qualities in, uh, in that Royal College guide. I think it's fair to say that there is no substitute for experience. And, um, you know, I, I think in this, in this remit, I'm still learning continuously. Every rupture is slightly different. As we've alluded to, planning and rehearsal is important. Um, I put this in as a, as a, a really as a personal uh, preference, but I very much prefer a plan A and trying to stick with it than having four or five different plans for contingency when things go wrong. I find that quite difficult for my brain to deal with, but it may be that you're different. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I try to do everything as I would in an elective case, but perhaps just a little bit more deliberately and a little bit more quickly. I put this in bold and underlined. Know your kit. And I really mean know your kit. Um, and you may think, well, you know, I know my kit, but do you really know how your Omnitrack goes on? What happens when your Omnitrack falls off? Do you really know what graphs you've got in the shelf that are on the shelf in your consignment stock? Um, do you really know what sheaths you need for that particular graph for your EVAR? Do you really know what graphs you have, how you can create buttress sutures, you name it? You need to really know your equipment and I would encourage you to make a list, to write it down and to look at it because I forget things all the time. Um, I think you have to know and, and, and trust your colleagues and, and that's back to empowerment really. And I've, I've put this, uh, this quote at the bottom, which I always, which, which I quite like and find quite funny. That a good surgeon is often wrong, but never in doubt. 
when, when the reality is we're often in doubt uh, and while you need to know your limits, you should be confident in your abilities and the abilities of your colleague when you take on these cases. Uh, and another sort of general point is that when things are difficult, you know, when the anastomosis is difficult or the exposure is difficult or there's some bleeding, we can become a little bit tunnel visioned and not have an eye on the bigger picture of what's happening with a patient, what's happening with your repair. I find a good way not to become tunnel visioned is to have a really good and clear ongoing dialogue with your anaesthetist during the procedure. I think you have to understand the, the impact of your behavior on your colleagues. I think if you're anxious and you are uh, potentially short tempered or angry or, you know, complaining at the scrub team for not having this, that or the other, they become inhibit inhibited and therefore less used to you. Um, so really consider that at the outset. As we've alluded to, calling for a colleague to come and help you is not a sign of weakness. And it's often, I think, a misjudgment if you end up phoning your colleague when it's too late, um, when things are, are sort of beyond salvage. So think about that at an early stage. It's not a sign of weakness. So there were some general points. Um, although this wasn't a technical talk, when I had a chat with Meryl today, we, we, we thought it might be useful to get the panel's opinion on some uh, common disasters that, that may happen uh, during ruptures and how the panel may deal with them. I always think uh, the trainees are really interested to hear how, how consultants may deal with the various disasters that can happen. So I've, I've just sort of listed a few here that we could talk. The first one's a really interesting one. Um, what do you do with a patient who's got a ruptured aneurysm, who you've decided you can repair by whatever means, and you decided that they're a candidate for repair, and either on their way to theatre or in theatre, they lose cardiac output. I find that incredibly difficult when you've got as far as getting the patient to theatre and they have a cardiac arrest. So what, how, would the panel, how did the panel deal with that when that happens? And I'm sure it's happened to everybody. From my point of view, I have I have done it both ways. I've I've had someone who uh, is just on the side of of salvageable in in my own brain, and I've thought I've um, uh, uh, it, it was worth a go and it should be done, and they've arrested, and I've said I'm sorry, but the chances of survival are now zero. And I have uh, done others where they've had a. Uh, what do you call it, Meryl? A, a, a slight cardiac arrest, and uh, and uh, but I've been honestly very keen, and they've done okay, but they do bleed like stink after a cardiac arrest, and you have to be prepared for it all, and you have to be prepared to work really hard. So uh, that would be my point of view, Meryl. I have to say, I'm I'm maybe with years, I'm starting to step back from if, if somebody arrests in lift or you're just about to put them on the table um, unless they come back after just a few pushes on the chest and once you're getting into inotropes etc I think your your chance of getting that patient back to a good quality of life out of the hospital is very very low let alone uh, your risk that uh, whether you'll get them off, off the table. And, and I'm interested to hear in the situation where you've had a patient that you thought was salvageable, who's, who's, who's arrested or, you know, peri-arrest, and you've decided not to proceed, uh, how, how, how do you do that? I mean, what, I know it's difficult, but, but uh, who do you speak? How do you make that decision? You know, what are the conversations that you have with the theatre team? Because typically they're, they're on go mode and, and they want to go. Um, and you sort of stopping it somehow feels like you're wimping out a bit and, and you're not. I think you're probably making an appropriate decision to not proceed because there's no chance of, of getting forward. How, how do you overcome that pretty difficult situation of discussing it with the team? As you've alluded, it has to be the whole team that is part of that conversation. And it also has to be a, a really good debrief once the inevitable has has occurred and you've you've stopped and the patient then dies um, you've got to have the whole team on board with that decision and as you alluded to in your first couple of slides how they feel 
uh, at the end of the day and um, they've then got to go home and come back to work the next day. Um, you've got to have a good uh, debrief at the end of, of a, at the end of a death when you've stopped. And so, they so I, I think that's key, Meryl. I think, you know, discussing with the, the ODAs, the sometimes there's A&E staff up in theatre, you really have to explain very clearly to everybody in theatre. It's not a decision that you and the anaesthetist take and then, um, you know, throw back to the team. Because I, people are upset if they rush a patient up to theatre and you've decided not to operate. It's undoubted that they are upset and sometimes more than we would be because unfortunately we've, we've probably seen it more. Um, so, so that's the point I wanted to get over. It's key that everybody in that operating theatre is involved and, uh, you know, uh, is explained the reasons for what you're doing. Um, I've just noted we're, we're at 20 past nine. I don't know, do we... We're nearly finished, but I, I don't quite know. Do we overrun Colin or do we? So, uh, so I, no, I think it, we need to uh, try and finish on time and probably wrap up. I think if you've got, I, I don't know, there are too many questions to answer, to be perfectly honest here. I would love to have a, 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 an excellent uh, conversation on leadership. Um, perhaps uh, there is a scope for another whole session on that we could perhaps try and answer any more questions over emails or at least type some of the answers uh, through through the chat if i'm allowed to um but if you've uh, but i'm yeah, happy I mean, to hear some closing points from you seamus because i think that's the most important thing yeah yeah i mean i think the other just point is openness and debriefing post-operatively um you have to debrief and you have to accept that, that we pour over the details of cases that have gone badly and we very uh, quickly rush over the details of cases that have gone well. But you have to reflect. You have to accept that it will have an impact upon you if you have a bad outcome. But when you do reflect, remember the data. The, the mortality for patients who we've decided to operate on is 35%. Um, okay, summary. Um, I, th I think uh, ru rupture, ru ruptured aneurysms will test your leadership <laughs> abilities almost more than your surgical skills, which to me is surprising. Um, recognize that uh, the vast number of people that can have a direct impact upon your patient's outcome and, and how, you, uh, how you communicate with them. I think be decisive but respectful to your team. Uh, and consider that your consultant role is often for the long term uh, and how you how you build teams around you is important not just for the case in front of you but, but for the case in years to come and I, th I think that's pretty much yeah and that's pretty much the summary so Colin so thank you Seamus for giving us some points I think we dealt very uh, I think you dealt very nicely with some of the human factors and non-technical skills. Uh, gave us something to think about with to do with errors and simulation, but also touched on some of these technical aspects that actually, even though they aren't necessarily what you think about immediately when you're talking about teams and the way that teams do, the relationship between the technical and non-technical skills is vitally important, not only because as the surgeon you're trying to do all the technical skills in front of you and organize your team technically, but also organize the personalities, culture and leadership around you. I think you talk very nicely on leadership and, and it is a subject that's um, got quite a lot of people talking in the chat and in the questions and answers. And I am told that we, a leadership talk would be useful uh, and human factors maybe in the next year. So hopefully we can do that. We can um, look at all the questions which are recorded and answer them post webinar. So I'll try and uh, see whether I, we can do something along these lines. Um, and otherwise, uh, uh, there's lots of people telling you what an excellent presentation it was. So thank you very much indeed. And that, I think we'll wrap up there unless any of the panellists have got any concluding comments. I shouldn't have asked that because I knew you were going to say nothing. But thank you very much to both of our panellists, Meryl, Waka, and all of the other Vassal Society people that are on the, on the line giving their comments. It was absolutely brilliant. I wish we could go on for hours. But uh, as I said at the beginning, it's my wedding anniversary, so you've all got to go now. See you later. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Seamus.